Nidandasya Kinajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yenatas Man Sri Gurudeva Maha Ram Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutalai Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Kinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishne Sasinya Vadi Vastyatya Devi Satarine Vanchakopa Turu Vizcha Vipa Sindhu Vibhacha Dhitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Advaita Gadadhar Srivasari Vor Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll uh, narrate. Tomorrow is, at least in this part of the world, I think it's all over the world. Tomorrow is the appearance day of Sri Ramchandra. Um, so tomorrow, at the same time, we'll continue with our discussion, but today I'll focus on one particular pastime which I think is um, one of the more uh, instructive pastimes. It's deep in Vaishnav culture, selflessness, sacrifice, and um, detachment. And that's the exchange between Lord Ramachandra and his brother Bart, which took place in the forest. <laughs> and it's a beautiful story, of course. We heard how the intrigue that Mantora Mantara tried to persuade Kaikei, and she successfully did. They changed the whole course of the plans for Ram to be put on the throne. And Kaikei, influenced by bad association, although she was a good person, she uh, went against everything, even her own uh, good qualities. And she acted like somebody who had never had that character ever before. Uh, and she arranged for using the boons that her husband uh, Dasarat had given her she took these two boons to request Dasarat to send Ram to the forest for 14 years and install her son, Lord, on the throne. We discussed that and how the anguish between the two, especially how Dasarat was overwhelmed with lamentation, heartbreak, and uh, confusion. But finally, he had to agree because uh, Kshatriya's word is more important than anything. 
And this is an interesting situation. Uh, of course, it was more than just keeping his word to fulfilling the promise of Kaikei. It was much more than that. It was actually uh, um, practically she put him in a position where he had no choice. <laughs> and after hearing from Ram, when Ram actually agreed to go to the forest, only then did, uh, did Dasarat somehow or other reluctantly resign himself to the fate that was unfolding. Mm -hmm. Now, Bart's away during this whole time. Bart is not really there. And uh, when he comes back, he learns what his mother had arranged. And he's, uh, he's really quite upset and angry he practically disowns his own mother. Um, the reason why sometimes a saintly person will cause pain to others is just like a doctor may cause pain to a uh, patient in order to cure him for a certain degree, uh, a certain disease. Some painful operation may have to be administered in order to awaken or to cure the disease and sometimes the spiritual master or a superior will cause pain to someone else because but it's for the rectification of the person so he practically told his mother yeah, after hearing what had happened and she was all surprised that he was acting this way, he was she was expecting him to be happy, but he was completely the opposite. He was angry, uh, disappointed, and he actually said he wanted to disown his own mother, Kakeya, like, you're not my mother, really. And that really hurt her really deeply. So that was the that was the operation that he applied upon her just to get her over this disease of envy. Mm -hmm. So now Bart realizes that Ram has gone. Many of the citizens followed later on, but they were lost and could not find Ram. Although they tried to, they reluctantly and unhappily returned to the kingdom and practically the kingdom was no longer a kingdom. It was just a town full of people who were no longer feeling the happiness of Ram's presence and were experienced the sadness of his disappearance from Ayodhya. Bart decided to want to rectify the situation and he made a plan to go to the forest and try to encourage Ram to return and take the throne. Because Bart was implicated also in the wrong way. He was being criticized and vilified as a person who was behind this whole thing, unbeknownst to, few, to many that it wasn't him, but it was his mother. Of course, many knew it was Kai Kei, but others didn't. <laughs> so Bart was also criticized for having this desire for power, which was not at all true. While they were in the forest, Ram and Lakshman had a discussion. But before that, 
this is the most interesting part of this thing is that Bart knew that if he came alone into the forest, he would not have as much influence. So he came with many of the citizens and his own army to encourage Ram, to petition Ram, to beg Ram to return to Ayodhya. Um, the tribal chief, Guha, who also had a small forest army, who met Ram previously when Ram was coming through his area, who welcomed Ram, who glorified Ram, who served Ram, who became a really close friend of Ram. When he saw the army of Bart approaching, he, along with, and later on, when they got closer to where Ram was, Lakshman himself misunderstood what was happening. They were both thinking that now Bart has taken the throne. He's afraid that Ram will try to come back and take over. So in order to do that, he's coming to the forest to kill Ram. So he will not make any attempt to try to regain his position in the kingdom. When the army was approaching where Lam, Ram Lakshman and Sita was, Lakshman noticed the army coming and he goes into a rage. <laughs> this is described in uh, the narration in the part of the Ramayan by uh, Subha Vilas in his presentation. And he starts vilifying, criticizing Bart, and he takes out his bow and he wants to annihilate the whole army of Bart along with Bart. Ram explains, has to explain that this is not actually true. Bart has not come for that reason. And there's a nice discussion, not discussion, there is a nice uh, explanation of the character of Bart given by Ram to Lakshman. And finally, Lakshman settles down because Lakshman's main concern was that Ram has all protection while he's in the forest. He is to be able, because one, one of the reasons why the Lord appeared in this particular incarnation, which is not known to too many people, it's one of the main reasons, is Lakshmi Devi, who took the form of Sita in this particular manifestation of appearance of both of them in this material world, she wanted to be alone with her consort, Lord Narayan. And this pastime was meant to give them that opportunity. And therefore she was able to spend 13 years alone with, uh, uh, oh yeah, actually yeah, 13 years because the last year she was, she was taken away by Ravana, 13 years with her husband alone. And during that time, Lakshman made sure that they had all the privacy they had, they needed and wanted and stood, stood guard over them both 24 hours a day, every day in the forest. <laughs> So now Lakshman is learning about the true character of Bart. And Ram explains the principles of the righteousness and attributes them to Bart. Lakshman is humbled by Ram's words. And then they both look out from where they are and they see the army led by Bart. Bart decides, understands the situation and decide, he, said, he tells his army to stay there along with many of the citizens that come. And he, without any weapons, without any armor, with anything, he approached the area where they were, which was a hill. They were in Chichikut at that time, Chichikut Mountain. 
So climbing up the mountain all by himself, Bart is coming. Ram, Lakshman, and Sita are seated around the sacrificial fire. And Bar, Bart is followed by Satrugna, his brother. Finally, they came into the presence of Sita and Ram and Lakshman. And Bart immediately falls flat in obeisances to his exalted brother. Satrugna follows along and also offers his obeisances. There's a very emotional outpouring between the brothers, very sweet embrace. And for many, even during that embrace and that outpouring, both of them remained quiet. They didn't speak so much. Both were overwhelmed with emotion seeing each other, that their hearts were just, getting, they were, con they were con connecting with each other from heart to heart. And there was no need for, or at least they didn't see any need to speak. Ram begins questioning. He's wondering how things are back in Ayodhya. How is my father? How are the mothers? How is your mother Kaikeyi? Ram wants to hear about how everyone's doing. This is like a few years after they had left Ayodhya. Now, after hearing that his father was no longer uh, living, he, he, Dasarat could not bear the separation from his glorious son. And so he died in lamentation. And uh, Bart had to break the heartbreaking news to Ram, and that was very difficult. Ram breaks down in emotion, but then after some time, he composes himself. And at the Mandakini River, which was nearby, they went and offered oblationships to the departed ancestors. Ram says, time and destiny are not in our hands. Disturbance is essentially not accepting the will of time and destiny. We cannot blame others. So what Ram is saying is that don't blame your mother for what is happening. Destiny is powerful and time brings about in destiny. So one should accept that that is uh, the higher powers are working in this particular. But Bart, he's equipped, he's ready. He's, he's been thinking how to somehow or other bring his to his loving brother, senior brother, back to Ayodhya to rule. So he explains using logic and argument that you are the qualified king. Actually, it was your father that wanted you to be on the throne, and therefore it was his will for you to take the throne. And then and of course, all the citizens are also feeling the same way. And so using so many arguments and logics and explaining how Ram's qualification is, is the, he is meant to rule. La Ram listens to all this, but then he responds that I have to follow the order of my father. We have to follow the order of our superiors, our gurus, our superiors are our mothers, our father, and our spiritual master. And in this case, my father acting in that role has asked me to come to the forest. So how can I disobey his order? And then there's arguments going back and forth. Ram says to Bart, you are not me, and you are needed and qualified to rule the kingdom. So please go back. Their father would be pleased if the, king, if the kingdom is ruled nicely, and you are qualified to rule the kingdom. 
Ram continues, no one can change destiny. Our reaction to destiny is our only free choice. Time is the factor that determines our fate. Now, this is an interesting thing that um, time catches up with everyone in this world. What we're meant to experience will happen in due course of time. We, not, we may not be able to change how destiny unfolds, but what we can do is that when destiny do, does come, we live by religious principles and continue to worship the Supreme uh, Lord in devotion without being deviated by the, by the elements of destiny. Just like here, we see we have this particular pandemic, at least this is what is being said. And then the world is trying to regroup, re -understand, to understand how to live. And people are looking for some solutions to go back to the way they used to live. Others are trying to readjust to the, to the, to the present living situation. But in any case for devotee, who finds himself in the midst of such apparent changes of events in the course of history, which doesn't affect the devotee directly, but may affect the, affect the devotee in some way, still they continue to worship with the, for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It's explained in the Shastras that there's a machine called the Deki machine. Deki is a wheat husking machine and in one particular song by Srila Bhakti Vinoda Kaur, he uses this analogy of the Deki machine to describe the mood of a Vaishnava. And he says that if you take the Deki machine from the earthly realm and you bring it to the heavenly realm, the Deki machine or the weak husky machine will husk wheat there. If you bring the machine to hell, it will do the same thing. Wherever you bring the machine, it functions in the same way. So in the same way, a devotee is not influenced by the course of events that surround them, but it always keeps their mind, their attention, their focus, and their goal on worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In fact, in many cases, it increases the enthusiasm and the determination to worship the Lord when time brings about difficulties. Bart tries to, but Bart, this, there's an interesting tug of love we call, we sometimes we call tug of war when two people are trying to defeat each other in a, in a, in a battle. But here, this is a, a tug of love well, one is trying to show their love for the other and the other one is trying to show their love for the other. So Bart, he's not going along with, or at least he's not accepting any of the, this, the uh, rationale given by uh, Ram. So he says to Ram, our father, he was under the influence of death. He acted irrationally. So how can we accept that what he did was done in the rational and a very clear, composed mind. Therefore, that, that instruction is, it was given in the wrong mood, under pressure. Therefore, we don't, you don't have to accept that because fa that was not father's desire. He was forced, therefore, therefore, please come back and rule the kingdom. And then Ram says something that hardly anybody knows. Ram revealed something to Bar at the time that very few people know. And Ram said that my, our father Dasarath, when he wanted to marry your mother, Kaikei, she was the beautiful daughter of King Kaikeya, who ruled the one kingdom. And our father said to 
King Kaikeya that I promise the son of Kaikeyi will rule the kingdom. Whoa, no one knew this, that, that this promise that Dasarat made to the father of Kaikeyi at the time of petitioning Kaikeyi to become his queen. But of course, Rod Bart is still not, we say, convinced that he should rule the kingdom. So then it's, it's a, you, when you read this section, you'll see how emotional it is. <laughs> both, are tr both are trying to give the other person everything and nothing for themselves. <laughs> Bard said, you are a natural king. You are destined to rule. How, you know, here you are in the forest. You will not, you will not, you know, fulfill your destiny as a, as a saintly ruler. And Ram just says, the forest is also a kingdom. So I will try to rule here in the forest. <laughs> So, so there is forgiveness. There is trying to understand what is justice and what is not justice. Trying to create harmony in chaos. Trying to find love when hatred was the, the mood on how things unfolded. It's mentioned that there are four points for perfection, peace, satisfaction, introspection, and wise company or wise association. Peace, introspection, satisfaction, and wise company are the four, four points of perfection. Peace is destroyed by material desires. Introspection is destroyed by ignorance. Satisfaction is destroyed by hankering. And wise company is destroyed by accepting misguidance or becoming misguided. Bart tries, continues to try to convince his glorious brother to come back and he speaks about the duties of the, the Shastriya, of the Kshatriya and accepting the right of austerity. Finally, it is seen that Bart has run out of arguments and Ram is not willing to return. Ram's basis for not returning is this is, I have to fulfill the desire of our father. He has asked me to come to the forest. How can I uh, disobey that instruction? Finally, Bart tries one more. He says, okay, one of us has to rule the forest and one of us has to rule the kingdom. So you rule the kingdom in Iodia and I'll rule the forest. <laughs> one, must, one son must stay here. So let me be that son. I'll stay and you go back. Ram says, I will rule the forest. It says, and then he makes a nice point. He says, position and power are not needed to perform one's duty. Interesting point. Position and power are not needed to perform one's duty. So Ram is talking about the duty of a subordinate to carry out the instructions of the superior. Convenience means to change the law to suit your own desires. 
Maturity means changing your life to honor the Lord, to honor the law. Ram says, charity once given cannot be reversed. Now, while this is going on, something really strange happens. <laughs> One sadhu came. His name is Jabali. And he comes and he starts speaking to Ram about the purpose of life is to enjoy. Life means enjoyment. And he's speaking in so many ways to explain how the nature of the living entity is to enjoy. And therefore, you are destined to enjoy the kingdom. So please go back. But Jabali used this reversed logic. He was trying to induce Ram in the way that he could not be induced. And you can read what Jalabi, Jabali's words. All it is is about material enjoyment and the living entity's desire to fulfill that enjoyment. But what happens was Ram really rejects him and practically gets angry with him. <laughs> but Jabali's intention was to get Ram to accept the kingdom. But the thing is, he used the wrong logic. <laughs> And it says that when you want to express something, you should not use some kind of um, hidden agenda. In other words, using the wrong intention to get something across, explain things from the intention that is needed. Otherwise, people will misunderstand the intention and not hear the words or they will not accept the intention. Vashishta is always there, is also there. He comes along and now he appears and he speaks from the position of the spiritual master who guides with intelligence. And he says, the father give life, the guru teaches how to live life. Ram responds, I will follow the instructions in the order given first by my father second by my spiritual master, and third by my mother. Bar is still trying to somehow or other show his love for his brother. So he says, if you do not come back, I will fast until death. <laughs> Ram becomes annoyed by hearing that, and he speaks to Bart and validates his source of obedience. Uh, Bart then finally runs to the citizens for insurance, assurances. Now he has no choice but to return. Bart knows that he cannot bring his brother back. He's tried everything. Now he has to, now he's faced with the idea of doing what is right. Sometimes it says people know what is right but they can't carry it out for whatever reason. This in the Shastra has a particular name. It's called Ridoya Durlobya. Ridoya Durlobya, which means weakness of heart, knowing what is right, but still cannot do it. Because it's basically because of material attachment. Sometimes even devotees face that. They know what is right. They're faced with the situation. They know what they should be saying and, and feeling and doing, but still there is that attachment that doesn't allow them. Just like we have the example of Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra knew, he knew his brother, his sons were avaricious. He knew that his brothers were acting against Dharma, against Krishna. And he went along with that, supporting his, his, not his brothers, but his sons. He knew, but his attachment to his sons was so strong that even though they were right, avaricious and wrong intentioned, 
He went along with them because of his family attachment. He couldn't give that up. He even admitted that at the end, that uh, I know what you're saying, Krishna, but my attachment's too strong. <laughs> Impulsive thinking causes one to act before thinking. Reflective thinking causes one to think before acting. Finally, a voice comes from the sky and speaks, Bart, follow the order of your brother Ram. Bart, everyone hears the celestial intervention. Bart has nothing else to say. Ram glorifies Bart for his humility and petitions him to seek wife's counsel and rule the kingdom. He said, and this is an important part, character is more important or better than competence. We can develop, there are many people who are very competent in doing things, but what is their character? But a person may not be so expert at doing things, but their character is, is, is glorified by others. So character is always better. So one should not sacrifice character for material gain. And sometimes we face that. Should I go along what I believe is right? Or should I go along what I believe will, I, will, I will gain because of accepting this other path? Bart says to, I'm sorry, Ram says to Bart, don't blame your mother, Kai Kei. You know, go back and give her the affection that a son is meant to give to his mother. She was simply misled by a maidservant. Bart finally comes to the conclusion that what, right, Bart, what Ram is saying will be so. And he is defeated by the love of Ram. But one last thing that Bart does, he leaves for a minute and comes back and he has the slippers of Ram. And he brings the slippers and he says, these are the slippers. Please place these slippers upon your head and bless them. And I will take those slippers and I will place those slippers on the throne in Ayodhya. Those slippers will be the indication of who is the actual ruler of Ayodhya. Bart finally says, I will accept to rule on your behalf. And Bart says, I will not rule the kingdom directly, but I will, I will rule from a distance. And then there's a loving embrace between Bart, Ram and Satruga and everybody leads for Ayodhya. The three mothers also came and Ram greeted each of the citizens that came and gave loving embraces to Kaikeyi, Sumitra and Kosyaya. This is a long, very long, uh, exchange between Ram and his mothers and some of the prominent citizens. And this is so beautifully described. There was so much love, emotion as they departed. Bart takes the sandals blessed by his brother Ram and he places it on the royal elephant. The sandals will give guidance, assistance and ruling and will bring the loving memory of Ram to everyone. Bard comes back and now he faces the citizens and he mentions what happens. And he explains how Ram has asked him to rule the kingdom. And he said, if you want to blame anything, please blame me. <laughs> and it's interesting because after Bart returned, he placed the sandals on the throne and he went to a place called Nandigram 
which is a little village nearby, which is and which faced the fires. And Bart, along with his brother Satrugna, stayed there for 14 years. And it's explained that Bart ate only barley cooked in cow urine for the full 14 years he was there. And people, the citizens would come out and ask him about different features on how to rule the kingdom. And he would pray to the sandals on the throne and then he would give his decisions and he would rule the kingdom from that way. So the shoes of Bart were, I'm sorry, the shoes of Ram were actually ruling the kingdom. Uh, here's we have, Bart was falsely accused. He didn't become angered about being come accused. His only disturbance was to witness what his mother created. Ram, this is some of the messages from that. Ram argues that one cannot swap karma. My karma is to come to the forest and be here. Your karma is to rule. And of course, just to fast forward the whole thing, after the 14 years, when Ram, Sita, the monkey soldiers, and some of the chief monkey soldiers are on their way back along with Bibishan, they were coming back to Ayodhya after 14 years. Ram told Hanuman, Hanuman, go forward and go ahead of all of us and meet Bart and tell him his brother is about to return and watch his reactions. If you see in any slightest way, he becomes disturbed or unhappy hearing that I will return, I will not return. So Brahm tested Bart just before returning. And of course, uh, Bart was overjoyed to hear that soon Ram, along with all of the uh, other members that were his associates, they all were coming back to the kingdom. This is a beautiful exchange of what is real love, what is sacrifice, what is duty, what is humility, what is self-sacrificing? This is all nicely explained in this particular pastime here. The goal is to please the Lord. Bart wanted to stay in the forest and that was easier for him. It was more difficult for him to return and rule the kingdom. But in order to please Ram, he did. So here's another example of how pleasing the Lord is more important than what we like or what we want to do. This was taught by Bart by accepting the fact that he should rule the kingdom simply on the instructions of his brother Ram. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, thank you very, very much. Uh, amazing pastimes of Ramayana. And as you rightly mentioned, uh, like in the Treta Yoga, uh, all the brothers really demonstrated uh, examples of humility, sacrifice, love and respect. While in this yoga, very, very rare just fighting everybody for their own self-interest and yeah so, that's kali yuga kali yuga influences everyone to become self-centered or selfish mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. so not to we, have, we have to rise above that mm -hmm. 
yes guru maharaj absolutely like and i think your last statement was the most important like this life is to please the lord so hmm. yeah and sometimes it's easy to sacrifice when apparently we are not uh, losing anything or giving up anything sometimes we can offer some sacrifice if it becomes convenient or it doesn't interfere with our own ideas but when it does then then that's the real test <laughs> Yes, Guru Maharaj. Guru Maharaj, we can't see you in case you have. Oh, okay. Let me give me my video there. Okay. Uh, I wanted to increase the audio by shutting down the video. <laughs> okay. So, Hari Krishna, dear devotees, if you have any questions, comments, or any realization, uh, please, uh, you unmute yourself, or you can type in chat window. and uh, i can read on your behalf hari krishna hari krishna guru maharaj um, please accept my humble obeisance as all glories to shri prabhu all glories to your holiness um, guru maharaj <clears throat> guru maharaj thank you so much for the wonderful class today and uh, um, so i was just uh, wondering like uh, um, so as vivek prabhu said that it's very hard to um, Uh, have a sacrifice sacrificial mood and selflessness towards others uh, especially in the family or among siblings like how Ra lord rama and bharata uh, showed us as, as an example but uh, it's very hard to do that because we are not used to or i am not used to that uh, kind of uh, uh, bringing or um, from since childhood so how to start with that guru maharaj like uh, so how to develop this quality when we understand it's for our best interest then therefore we have to reflect and think before we simply decide to act or not act and let us see try to understand well here i am in this situation uh in order for things to go on someone has to make a sacrifice when there's more than one people involved person involved we thought think well maybe that person should sacrifice but then again sometimes we find ourselves that there's no other choice just like we see we and this is common that in in a parent it's this is called the sacrifice of love is then when but this love of love is natural is that the mother when she has the child and the child is just a new baby um she's willing to do anything and everything necessary to make sure that child gets everything it needs so it can remain healthy and fulfill its needs as a child so she gives up her sleep she uh changes her whole life maybe even gives up some of the activities she's performing in order to dedicate her time completely to the child which is required so that sacrifice is a little bit more natural because the love for the mother and the child is automatically there so when you speak about that sacrifice then when love is not there or if it's there only in the small then making that sacrifice becomes a lot more her way test of our our nature whether we can do it or not but we have to see who what is the benefit people you see sometimes you see people in the material world they will sacrifice their life in order to go fight for their country they get into this uh, country spirit i belong to this nation and this nation and my country is being threatened so i must be willing to go out there and fight and if i have to i will sacrifice my life for, the, for my country so this is sacrifice in somewhat of a mode the mode of passion 
because it really doesn't bring much different much gain to anyone even the person who makes the sacrifice there's some false ownership there but then again we see in the family the father has to provide everything for the family members so he has to sacrifice his time in order to do that mother has to do the same thing to serve serve the husband and serve the children so when we arrange it in such a way that it goes on normally, it doesn't long, any longer become a sacrifice. But then again, sometimes something happens where maybe one of the children uh, doesn't act in the proper way or is in trouble. And then the parents have to somehow make up for that and perform some, what we say, giving up what they want to do in order to save the situation. So sacrifice for another person's benefit is actually a, a cause of happiness. People do it in the material world and because they have some desire to fulfill by doing that. There are people who like to sacrifice for others because they get some name and fame. They become popular, they become glorified. Oh, this person sacrificed so much in order to help these other people. The doctors will go into the COVID patients areas and take a risk of getting sick in order to help the patients. <laughs> so we see on all levels, humans are sacrificing time, energy, and even their personal lives for the benefit of others. So sacrifice is actually a principle of human life, which inspires a person to develop uh, a character and quality that is satisfying. Uh, people will sacrifice a lot of times just for themselves. <laughs> what can I gain in this thing? And uh, when there's a little bit of gain for one's interest in doing something, it becomes more natural or easier to perform the activity. But when there's nothing in it for me and everything in it for the, for the, for the object that I'm sacrificing for, then what can we get from that? We can get the happiness that comes by way of that sacrifice when it benefits the object that who we sacrifice for. In other words, when we make, we become happy if we can do something even in a sacrificial way to benefit others. And then, and then we see that they have gained and become happy by that, we also become happy. So that's human nature. So that's why Prabhupada said, um, uh, our, our movement is paropaka. Paropaka means to do good for others. <laughs> our movement is not simply trying to create a, a religious organization in a society where we can live nicely according to certain rules and regulations and enjoy life. Our, our whole method of Krishna consciousness is to expand this knowledge and this practice and to give benefits to all. So preaching is another form of sacrifice for the benefit of others. So when you look at the word sacrifice comes from the Latin word sacrificio. Sacrificio means to make sacred. So there's an old saying that love begins where sacrifice begins. When there's no sacrifice, there's no love. <laughs> or it it's comes on as a personal emotion, but it's not really love. You'll see that in, sometimes in the families, when there is some breach of relationships due to certain incidents, people want to give up the relationship rather than take time to make some sacrifice to repair the relationship, which is really the solution to the problem. So therefore, sacrifice really brings about, when we say good qualities and benefits, benefits others. Ram sacrificed everything by going to the forest. There were many reasons why he did that, but in order to fulfill, but the main reason was to fulfill the instructions of his father. To disobey his father 
what for him would have been worse than death. His father was like his spirit. His father told him, now I want you to rule the kingdom. He said, my dear father, I will accept. And then when his father changed and said, now you should go to the forest. He didn't say, well, you told me to rule the kingdom. Now why are you changing? No, he said, oh, if this is your desire, then I'm prepared to fulfill that. So it's not always easy, but it's the principle of relationship. And you'll see the more people sacrifice for each other, how everyone benefits by that. The person who is sacrificing and the person who is the object of the sacrifice, everyone benefits. Because the selflessness is the principle which brings in the mercy of the Lord. When we act selflessly, we are and then even on the material level, the mercy of the Lord comes into that situation and people become happy. So especially, it's especially true in Krishna consciousness. So it's not always easy. Sometimes we have to get counseling, encouragement, words of advice from others to help us go through these trials, which, which are where we are faced to sacrifice. But well, one who lives for the benefit of other, others actually lives, and one who lives only for their own benefit. As Srila Prabhupada used to say, there are two types of devotees in our movement. One who practices Krishna consciousness for their own benefit, and one who practices Krishna consciousness in order to benefit others. He says, the second group gets recognized by Krishna. <laughs> but it's actually a feature of love, and love is the feature of the living entity's existence. So sacrifice brings about them an expression of love, and love makes one happy. I don't, know if that help, I don't know if that yeah. helps at all. Yes, yes, it will. It is helping Guru Maharaj. So um, basically, I understood that when wherever there is love, um, there is automatically the sacrificial mood and we are ready to do some sacrifice. And uh, it's all very natural. Um, it should be natural. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, I have to develop more of this Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Well, our conditioning makes us think and act in a certain way. This yeah. is what Krishna consciousness is about, is to teach us that there is a, another way to live life that is actually more happy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in the middle, uh, if, if uh, any thought like that comes, uh, suddenly one more thought will come, why should I do that? Uh, like my ego will come in the middle <laughs> and then it will ups, um, it will say like, why, why always I should... Uh, sacrifice everything, uh, why other people don't do that, um, that also comes in. <laughs> I would suggest, and there's a beautiful pastime in the ninth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the story of Rantidev, King Rantidev. If you're uh, reading that story, well, un you'll understand what sacrifice means. <laughs> no, one can, uh, no one can sacrifice on the level of Rantidev. Mm -hmm. His sacrifice was way beyond anyone's ability to even begin to understand. But he was a king and he did it to please others. And he became glorious and famous for his sacrifice. That's good, Manas. Thank you so much. I'll read it. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Namrata. <clears throat> no, no, it's okay. You can continue. I'll ask after you. 
Okay, Shidhi Mataji, please go ahead. Okay. Please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Your Holiness. Thank you for narrating to us this very beautiful pastime of Bharat and Lord Ram meeting in the forest and the dialogue that ensues and how each is trying to convince. And then finally, Bharat accepts that this is his duty, even though his preference is to be with Ram. Um, I'm also feeding off of uh, my thought process of Lavanya's question of sacrifice. And I'm thinking about the typical Indian mother who sacrifices so much, you know, for the children, for the home, for the husband, for the in-laws, for relatives, for everyone. I've heard so many stories now. And uh, sometimes you see that the children from these homes, they're so pampered, you know, the mother will, uh, today I want idli, then the other person says, no, I want uh, medhuvada, then I want this, I want that, somebody else wants. So all the time she's just running around trying to please everyone and trying to sacrifice. And many times I've heard mothers say, I'm taking so much care of the family. I'm sacrificing my time and energy for them. I have no time for me. And uh, I cannot chant my rounds because my family needs me. That's one. Second, I hear um, so many aches and pains and problems and backache and this thing and that thing. No time for self-care. So, and then, by the time the kids are grown up, they're really selfish, entitled, lazy, inconsiderate of uh, what she has done for them. And then when she starts griping and complaining about her bodily ailments, they say, okay, okay, I'm going out now. I've heard enough of these stories. So I'm just concerned about how to balance these things so that the people who are at the receiving end just don't take her for granted like that. Hmm. Well, misplaced sentiment. <laughs> misplaced sentiment. Not knowing what is beneficial, but accepting everything in the idea of helping others. In misplaced sentiment. Prabhupada tells two stories. Both of them were factual stories during the time when he was growing up in India. And uh, both are very powerful. I'll tell, I'll tell one of them. Um, there was this young boy, his mother, she, he was very young, just a little boy. So his mother died young and his father had already left before his mother died. So his auntie decided she took the, the care of the child and raised the child as her own. Now the child growing up took advantage of his auntie and kept asking him her for everything. And she would give him whatever he wanted if she could. And at the same time, she would never discipline him she would let him do whatever he wanted, and so even when he did the wrong things. This went on for many years, not correcting the child, not disciplining him, not refusing him, just saying, feeling that my love for him is to allow him to do whatever he wants. And that she was generally feeling like that, that, that she should just give him everything he wants. And that is the way she can show love for him. Finally, the boy started growing up bad and he starts stealing things. And she's never, she never said anything, anything. Finally, his thievery turned into something horrible and he killed somebody. The boy was brought to court. He was standing in front of the judge. The judge said, ultimately, because of your crime, you have to give up your life. He received the death sentence. <laughs> the boy said to the judge, he said, before you take me away, uh, I would like to speak to my auntie who was in the courtroom at the time. And so, she was crying 
she was there and she was crying. So he came, he came up to her. She was very emotional. He came close to her like he was going to whisper something in her ear. But when he got close to her ear in a very vicious way, he bit her ear with his teeth really hard. And he, she jumped back and screamed. And then he said to his auntie, now you are crying. It is too late. If you would have taught me what was right, you could have avoided all these tears. So the boy actually showed how much he really didn't appreciate, although he allowed it to go on, what his auntie was doing, misplaced sentiment. She thought she was helping him by giving him everything he wanted, but actually she was hurting him. And when it came to that situation, and then everything was revealed that her permissiveness was actually her foolishness or her lack of understanding of how to discipline, how to give the child actually what he needs. Hmm. Prabhupada tells that story, misplaced sentiment a wrong sentiment. To say no to someone you love for the benefit of that person is good. Hmm. One who says yes all the time is really not a leader or a teacher or a guru or a parent. So love or concern means to understand how to lead another, guide another, in the right way and not simply allow them to do whatever they want to do in the name of permissiveness or love. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, Guru Maharaj, very, very clearly that discipline is also very important. Just giving them love and allowing them to do whatever is not really love. So there has to be some tough love what is the second story, Guru Maharaj? You said there are two stories. Yeah, the other one Prabhupada tells more often about this little boy. He was three years old. He came down with typhoid fever. And the doctor told his mother, you have to, uh, the boy has to fast. If he eats, he could pass, he could die because of eating. Therefore, he must fast. So the boy was three years old. He wasn't understanding the importance of fasting, but his mother was doing everything she could to make sure that he fasted. And one time she had to go out and do some shopping. So she said to her daughter, who was 11 years old at the time, you take care of your little brother and I'll be back. And if he asks for anything to eat, do not feed him because he can get very sick and die. So the mother left. And then the boy starts crying to the sister, oh, give me paratas, I want paratas, I want paratas. And boy is crying, he's making a scene. So the daughter, she just falls victim to the boy's sentiment and she makes him paratas. And she gives it to the boy and he eats it. When the mother came back, she was angry, so angry at her daughter that she's scolding her daughter and her daughter's crying, can't understand why her mother is so angry. She was just trying to make her little brother happy, but she had forgotten. And this emotional outplay by this boy that it was bad for him to eat. Fortunately, the boy didn't die. The Prabhupada describes that this particular story happened in his neighborhood when he was growing up. The boy didn't die, he lived this somehow. But the point was, the daughter could not understand why she was being so, so uh, harshly treated by her mother. Misplaced sentiment. So how should 
a mother balance out all her different duties? That, requ that, that requires intelligence. If she's a mother, she has to know. It's her duty to know how to guide her children. With the help of the father, both of them together have to work together. They become the main force within the child's development. It says in the Shastras, one should not become mother, father, guru, teacher, if they're not qualified to take their disciples back to the spiritual world. Qualification has to be there in order to take leadership. You can't become a leader without the qualifications of a leader. Otherwise, you become a misleader. And that's what we have today. We have people in positions all around the world who claim to be experts, but don't, don't know anything about what they're doing and are simply interested in the, the pecuniary gains that they can achieve from the positions they have. They're not interested in the people. They're interested in their own uh, positions and the respect and honor that comes with the positions like that. So in today, there is no leaders in the world. Everyone takes a position because of being expert at getting positions like that. It's like the whole voting thing in America is a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. The whole uh, elections already are known ahead of time who's gonna win because they have plans to put a particular person in power and nobody's voting can change that it's all rigged all the elections one person was telling me every time he this girl she was she's a devotee she said her father when when it's time for elections he would fill his pockets up with the money and go for the to the election booths he knew how to influence the elections <laughs> So, you know, people are not interested in helping others, but in the name of helping others, they take positions of influence and rule and just make a mess. <laughs> and that's what we have today in society. And therefore, nobody trusts leaders because by nature, they're untrustworthy. They're not qualified to lead. They don't lead by character or by concern. They lead simply by some power, some position with some, some developed intelligence. So yeah, parents have to know how to be a parent. You can't fake it when you get there. You have to, it's a responsibility. Therefore, when uh, a child is growing up, she sees how her mother or when the boy's growing up, he sees how his parents treat him and he grows up in the right way. Therefore, he has the experience also of being both the object of control and in the position later in life of being in control. The disciples later becomes the spiritual master. He learns how to become a disciple from the spiritual master. So when he becomes a spiritual master, he knows how to guide his disciples. Yes, Guru Mara, thank you very much for pointing out how serious this is. Um, I think it's given me a lot of food for thought, uh, being a mother myself about how to do things in such a way that my daughter, whose birthday it is today, feels inspired um, in Krishna consciousness. This is a very tall order, actually. So, mm -hmm. Well, your daughter's in the position she's, a, she's grown up now. So it's not, you don't play the role of the ruling mother. You play the role and you play the position of the loving parent who is a friend. That's Chanaka Pandit. From after the age of 15, the parents become friends to their children more so than, you know, rulers. 
the formative years are from the age of six until 15. There's where you are very strict. That time of the, of the children's life is their strictness should be very strong from the age of six to 15. After 15, it's more like friendship. Because then they respect you. But if you keep treat, treat, treating them as children when, when they're starting to get in their late teens, they will, they will reject a lot of what you have to do. Because that's not the role. The role is to be a parent, but a friend in that, in that. You can also guide, but you have to know how to guide without being in the mood of, well, I'm the parent and you're the child and you have to follow. That doesn't work. It's never worked. It didn't, doesn't work in Vedic society. It doesn't work in modern day society, especially. That friendship will endear the child, not child, but the, the uh, daughter or son more to the parents. Because at that time, they, they, can, they start thinking for themselves. More so than before. So what if you didn't have role models like that growing up, Guru Maharaj, uh, yourself? You, you were not born in the movement. Your parents were not Krishna conscious. And even if, you know, the, the dynamics were such that you couldn't really learn anything from them, you had to just start off on your own. Then how do you get those skills required to be a good parent when you have, don't have good role models? Well... The later in life that these things are needed, the harder they are to develop. When they're done in the early part of life, they take part, they, they actually enter into the, into the psyche and become naturally a part of one's nature and one's activity. But when, if you're in that role, you have to learn it somehow. That's why Krishna consciousness <clears throat> Prabhupada used to say, you know, he was preaching to young people. Mm -hmm. He understood that to bring old people to Krishna consciousness was very difficult because they're so set in their own ways. But still, he gave everybody a chance. But for those to develop, <coughs> he knew that the young people were more open and receptible. <clears throat> so it's not a question well it's too late or I didn't get the chance when I was young if you have that position you have to learn <laughs> whether whatever time in life you find yourself in so it becomes a responsibility but the power of Krishna consciousness is is that when we chant the holy names of the Lord, we get we can access the mercy of the Lord, which helps, which gives us the strength to move in the direction that we need to move into. And so the spiritual strength coming from the Lord through his mercy, especially through the holy name, is a very dynamic factor which will make a big difference in, in achieving our are the qualities that we want to achieve. But in the material world, it's hard because people are still on their own or they, they try to take, that's why there's so many, you see what are the main books on the, uh, on the, uh, on the market today that sell all these books about self-help, self-development they call now they call it mindfulness what is this mindfulness well we're telling you control your mind and senses that's what we're saying that's mindfulness <laughs> control your mind and senses and directed it towards 
towards this, the spiritual uh, realm. There's mindfulness. People can't even control their mind, so they write books on mindfulness. <laughs> it's just some, you know, some ploy to sell books because everybody's thinking everything's going wrong in life. What am I going to do? Well, I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to learn this. I need to learn that. So they're teaching principles that should have been taught when they were growing up in the family, but because the family is not <laughs> wasn't able to teach. Now they're trying to learn it through these self-help programs, self-help societies, uh, creating this society, that society, this group, that group. What what people do naturally growing up, now it becomes a, a marketing advice on how to sell books, on how to be, how to be happy, how to be a good partner in life, how to be mindful, how to be sacrificing, how to, how to, how to. All the books are how to, how to, how to. But nobody's asking the, book, the question, why? <laughs> Yeah, isn't that true? Everything now is self-development through all these different ideas that these psychologists and various types of thinkers in society now have written books about. And they're always trying to come up with something new because whatever they come up with may work for a few, a little while, maybe a few years, and then it falls apart because it's material and it's not really meant to be used in that way. And then they try to come up with something to counteract that or to further their ideas of development. So they go on like that with more and more ideas, more books. Here's something else new. But there's an old saying, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> So if you practice Krishna consciousness, you're inclusive of everything. Everything is there in Krishna consciousness. Social, political, familial, aesthetic, moral, organizational. Everything is there in Krishna consciousness. There's nothing we have to learn new. It's all been part of the Vedic scheme. And it's taught perfectly by people who practice it in the same way. The study to understand the psychophysical nature of the living entity and how to develop their qualities growing up in the family and in the educational systems was part of Vedic culture. But now, because they don't know how to, they don't know how to grow up their own children, they let the children do whatever they want to do, give them whatever they, the children cry, complain, and make a big scene if they don't get what they want. And then the parents either become too harsh and the children run away or they give them everything and just spoil them. Because <laughs> people don't know how to raise children. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj, that is so true. That is so true. It's a very very challenging time we are in and uh, there's a very great need for Krishna consciousness, for Krishna conscious families, parents to raise a new generation at least right so that we can reverse all these trends which are so disturbing and causing so many problems in the world. Yeah, the, the big change happened after World War II. After World War II, the whole world really started to move in a different direction. The industrial society, technolo technology, and all these things came in and became the focus of people's lives. And relationships fell to the side. Everything was about getting, getting more, getting more, doing more, getting more, being more. Let's, for the last 60 years, we've been 
in 60, 70 years, we've been on this downslide of the, the whole human society has been downsliding. <laughs> Even before then, but it really started to exacerbate in that direction. And then right after World War II. So for this ideal society, this Ram Rajya, where there will be genuine peace and harmony and goodwill and brotherhood and caring and community, we really need a, a return to, to God consciousness, to Krishna consciousness, correct? Prabhupada, he gave the formula, start these farm communities and develop simple living, get away from all of this you know, soul-killing city life, which is just sapping the energy and good qualities of the living beings. Prabhupada had the vision. He, he, he told us what we should be like and told us how to do it. And at the same time, he had a vision for the society in general. Start these farm communities, simple living, high thinking, communities, Come out of your little box and develop community. Develop relationships with other Vaishnavas. He wanted to create the family, Krishna's family within the world. We have our nuclear family, and that's nice. But the real family is that family which is eternal. The eternal family is Krishna's family. Those who are practicing together the process of becoming Krishna conscious. And that requires community. Therefore, Prabhupada had a vision for how to develop that in a social and political way. And he made it known to his, us on how to do it. Uh, yes, Guru Maharaj, with your merciful guidance and blessings, surely um, we as a God family can brainstorm and try to help each other, you know, come together as a family and, and enthuse each other and support and help each other. Right now yeah, we're all... There has to be a plan, though. The sentiment is not, is not enough. Everybody has the sentiment, but unless it takes an active plan, it won't happen. And for plan, you need leadership. And for plan, you need vision. So leadership, we have to accept leadership. And the, the vision, the leader has to have a vision in order how to, how to do it. Prabhupada gave his leaders, those that he empowered to take charge of his society, the responsibility to create that vision and to lead the rest of the society. But Prabhupada put everything in his books and in his lectures and in his discussions, everything is there. Through his books, through his letters, through his lectures, through his personal discussions, everything Prabhupada wanted for the society has been explained. Now it has to be studied, understood, gleaned, and then put into practical plans. And it's easy. If, and it's being done to some degree, but it still needs to continue. And what we have to get away from is listening to all of the materialistic ideas that present solutions to the so-called problems and incorporating all these ideas and thinking that these practical solutions that the, that the materialistic society has is better than what Prabhupada has. <laughs> Prabhupada is long-term. A lot of these other solutions apparently are just quick fixes to a little problem that appears. Prabhupada's talking long-term. Just like there's two kinds of medicines, at least basically there's basically two main types of medicines. There's allopathic and Ayurvedic. Most people go for allopathic medicine. Why? Because it's quick. 
But Ayurveda is more efficient, but it's long-term. People don't want the long-term one because it apparently takes too long. You have to change your lifestyle. You have to change your eating habits. You have to change a lot of things. Allopathic doesn't really get into that. Oh, you got this symptom? Here, take this medicine. And the symptom is cured, but the disease remains. Ayurvedic studies the individual and understands its psychophysical and biological nature um, administers the cure in a in a step by step way, which takes sometimes years, but is most effective, and completely uproots the disease. I mean, Ayurveda is so perfect in its presentation of medicine, and I can tell you something that will you might not even believe it, <laughs> but. Just to illustrate the power of Ayurvedic medicine, I heard these from some of the top doctors who minister Ayurveda. One of the one of the disciples of one of the top doctors in in Kerala. He's a, a supreme Ayurvedic physician. His name is his name is Sin. What is his name? Uh, Kumara something Kumara. Sachi Kumara, Sachi Kumara, his disciple, he was telling me, along with many of his other uh, doctors, that they can take a person who is an old man or an old lady and again give them a young body. It's possible through Ayurveda. That's the power of Ayurveda. The process takes nine months to do. And it's a very difficult process. Nobody wants to do it because it's very difficult. But that's just to show the efficacy of this, how powerful it is. So in the same way, Krishna consciousness is the long-term solution for all the problems. So people are looking for the quick fix. So they go this way and that way to other sources. And it seems like, oh, well, here's the solution but it, it may just cover over the problem and appear to give it some kind of solution. But the problem's not gone, it just hides itself for a while. Just like sometimes in allopathic medicine, they try to, uh, they try to kill, cure cancer. So they go in there with their operations and their thing, and they remove most of the cancer, but some of the cancer goes to another place and hides in another part of the body and grows there. And then they find it there and then they try to operate it there and they get rid of most of it and then moves to another place. So they're just attacking the disease directly, but they're not attacking the, court, the, the source of the disease or what is the purpose of the cancer coming into the body. So this is an example of how two types of apparent solutions to the same problem have different effects. So in the same way, the solution that the materialists give for the problems of society is not a solution. Even the well-intentioned persons, when they present their solutions, just give a quick piecemeal solution, which doesn't get to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is changing the character of the person and not so much dealing with the problem that the person is exhibiting. When you change their character, you change their, their life. That's Krishna consciousness. That's Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is the complete overhauling of the living being's existence on all levels of, the, on all levels of development. When we understand that, then when we read Prabhupada's books, everything becomes clear. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. That was very extensive and very clear. Thank you very much. That's Thank Krishna you. consciousness. It's the long-term solution. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. 
Can I just share something with uh, my help, Lavanya and Sridevi, and they were talking about? Madhvi, uh, Madhvi, before you start, Madhvi, um, in I, 20 minutes, I have to give a class at the temple. Okay. So, okay. so take. If it's, take if no it's more too late, Marj, Marj, I can say uh, tomorrow, no problem. We can get no, you it can tomorrow. Say it, say it quickly and I'll... Okay, uh, I'll say it quickly. It's like uh, about the children. We have to know the psychology. Uh, recently, I had a, one of my mentee, because this younger one can't take it up, and her daughter now grew up six, and suddenly, because being in house all the time with this COVID and that, her mind, she found a remote control to uh, open the tele TV, so she opened it up. If, Normally, she's given one hour every day, and she wouldn't get, uh, 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 stop it. Her mom said, three times, stop it. It's time is over. She didn't. So then she said again, and suddenly she st uh, the daughter started throwing anything she could get in her house. And mother was really annoyed. She couldn't stop. Dad couldn't stop her. And then suddenly, afterwards, she rang me. Mother says, what have I done wrong, Mataji? What can I do? I said, nothing you can do, you have to be friendly, just leave her for a little while and then that. So next day then I uh, was going to ring her and I met her and I said, what was wrong yesterday? Why did your mood change? I heard, so, oh, my mom told you. I said, no, Krishna told me that something is wrong. You feel bad, are you feeling bad because you were in the house or something happened? He said, yeah, I was bored and all that, and mom wasn't letting me watch the TV. I said, okay, you could have done something else, you know? Read Krishna's book. I said, okay. Then after, that was fine, and she said, sorry, and all that. Uh, next time she came into the, our mentee, Sangha, and said, Mother, can I ask you some question? I said, yes, what? He said, can you tell me, like my mom was upset, and Krishna told you that my mom was upset because I, I did stupid thing. I shouldn't have done. Does, uh, uh, if a disciple does that, does Guru know? Krishna tells Guru that the disciple has been stupid? I'll answer your question in... Uh, yeah, um, so stupid. So I said, yeah. So she felt that I'll no. answer your question. Correct myself, you know? Mm -hmm. I'll ask your question in... I'll answer your question the way Prabhupada answered the question. Yeah. He, he says the, the guru knows exactly what he needs yeah. to take care of the disciple. Yeah. So being six year uh, old, she got sense of. Okay. Space. Thank you, Madhavi. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Vivek, can yeah, you close? Thank you, Guru. Yeah, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much for- I'm, I'm sorry, but I have this class coming up in 20 minutes at the temple. Sure, sure, get... Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Gurudev ki jai. 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 Uh, happy Ram Nomi. Hare Krishna. Thank, Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj.